they treated me. People ask me how I got my start in racing and it wasn't fuel funny cars. You have to go back a lot of years, back to the 60s. When you grow up in that little trailer house that you've seen, that you grew up with your brothers and sisters, you don't have your own room. You sleep on a couch or in a bunk bed. So when I was 14, I had a car. I had so many traffic tickets, you wouldn't believe it. I was down at DMV every week because a car was my life. And every time I could sneak it out of the driveway, I did. Because in that car, I had my football helmet, my school books, and I had my girlfriend's picture on the dash, because that was your room. Where all the other kids lived in houses with their own room, or maybe they shared it with their brother or sister, that car was my room. So I found my days riding around in a car. Didn't want to go home late at night because mom and dad and the brothers are watching TV. And if you didn't sit down and watch TV, you stood in a corner, so you lived in your car. A car become a way of life. Also, I'm a gypsy. My dad and mom trucked up and down, all over picking berries, logging, hauling cows, doing everything. So if I stay on the move, I feel like I'm okay. I was standing one day with my daughter and I was staring at a railroad train going by and she said, Dad, you look like you almost want to jump on that railroad train. And I said, Brittany, I said, the reason is there's something about that train going by that takes away the anxiety inside of me. It takes away the pain. She said, well, I don't understand that. I said, you will one day. It takes you somewhere down that track. It gets you away from the problems that you have. It's mental. It, it, it's really a true thing that gypsies want to continue to keep moving. And that's what they do. So racing only made sense that I would travel continually. I was an innovator during those times. I was the guy that had the fire in Orange County and the, the, the roof on the car melted down flat, the pictures on the wall melted down flat. I couldn't get out the windows and I couldn't get out the roof. And I cut a hole in the roof so I could make an exit. I don't really care about credit, but I was in safety in the early days. We started looking around. Not that I was smart, I didn't have any education. <clears throat> but we had this car that was a moving billboard, 250 miles an hour back then, and you could put signs on it. John learned over the years that you can, if you can't win a race, that thin line, that thin line between spectacle and spectacular, is the difference in what the people that that that, that want to put their name on your car is all about, and it's called exposure. He invented the word signage. He figured out that if you can't win then you have the biggest fire. And for Dome used to get mad at him. This is a God's true story. Get mad at me, you'd say, you son of a buck. I won Indy and you got the front page of the Indy because he's a ball of fire. And if he couldn't win, he would go to the ditch. Well, I didn't really set it on fire on purpose. I no, but I mean, he would let it get out of control. In 1978, I went out for my first NHRA national event, and I was a total leaker. I was a nobody. To qualify for that race, you had felt that I just stole the world. It's a feeling you can't explain to be with the names like the Blue Max, Jungle Jim, Don Fredome, Tom the Mo Mongoose McEwen, Shirley Muldowney, Big Daddy Darn Garlets. These people were legends. They were like gods, they were icons. And to think that I was able to walk amongst them. And trust me, I went everywhere telling them I qualified and Perdome laughed, who is that guy? But it didn't matter. It was unbelievable. Here's my big shot, I'm gonna go out and race. You know what I mean? I get to do the burnouts, you know, you know, the Pomona Fairgrounds were packed that day. Big old smoky burnouts, but I was racing a kid they called 240 Gordy, Bonin. He drove the bubble up car out of Canada. And it was unbelievable. And then he smoked me off, beat me probably by 10 cars, but it didn't matter. When I got out the other end, they were over there trying to interview him because he won. I was screaming so loud, the camera guys got confused. They thought I won. And they all ran over to me and the producer yelling, wrong driver. They said, well, what the hell is this guy yelling about? He got beat. That's how I was, just to be there, just to be a part of it. And then I walked around bragging to my sponsors yeah, I got beat at the Nationals last week by 240 Gordy because everybody knew who he was. And that's the way 
I lived it. That's the way I dreamed it. My wife used to say, John, sometimes you're embarrassing. Shouldn't brag about getting beat. It proved I was there. I couldn't brag about winning, but it was the best time of our life. Then my kids were starting to get born and they went to the races and at Indy in the summer, the biggest race, you know, and we won Indy, the bud shoot out that year. And it's like, the babies are getting new shoes. Louie's getting new shoes. <laughs> life was good. And we had eat, and then we were broke, we didn't eat. That's how we lived. We had a lot of baloney though. When John got Castrol, it suddenly was a good sponsorship that was, you know, going to be behind him. And when he had the money, he was able to um, hire a good crew chief, actually have a real team behind him. And of course, he had a few years of learning how to drive on his own, so he gradually became a better driver. So I think everything kind of fell together um, mid-80s, uh, and it still took him a few years to get his first win. I think it took nine runner-ups until he got his first win. And then, you know, once he got a taste of that, well, there was no stopping him. The fans are the ones that buy the Castrol product. Therefore, the fans are also our boss, as well as Castrol. And that's why you'll notice whenever he stands in line signing autographs, he will never, ever rush anybody. He will stand there and talk to that person, make eye contact with them, ask them personal questions about themselves. He, when they walk away, they will think John was their best friend. He will never rush them. I've seen John take off his hat and put it on their heads. I've seen him pick up handicapped kids, carry them around through the trailer or through the pits and give them a personal tour. I've never seen anybody else do that. John did that because he had a real connection with people that are handicapped because of his, his polio that he had. And he always identified with them and he spent as much time as he could. The best thing about him has always been his willingness to do whatever it takes to satisfy the customer and in our case, the customer is the media, the fan, and the sponsor. When I started with Castrol back in 85, um, actually my first year was, I'd lost the oil company I was with, and they gave me like $5,000 in oil. And right off the bat, I really liked the oil because it had bearing life. And so we saw that as a positive, and we had 5,000 bucks so we could eat. But understand my sponsorship back then was $40,000 with Coca-Cola and Wendy's. We were starving. We were just existing. And when you look back, it wasn't 15 years later that my payroll was 40,000 a week. Now my payroll is 100,000 a week. Tell me what's wrong with this picture. But as we evolved, what I got was a guarantee and a contract that said, I'm gonna be here this year, next year, and the next year. We got three year contracts. They gave me stability for the first time in my life. We were running from race to race, existing, borrowing money from my dad, any friend that I could. Castro gave me $110,000. And I ran around the day that check showed up. I was running around, I just looked like I'd lost my mind. That I was going, and I didn't get the 100 up front, but I had a check that I had a sponsor. Because no matter how they have a contract, till the check shows up, you don't know if you got a deal. But then I had stability. I had Austin Coyle. I just hired him the year before. And he found out I had no money and I just sold the Castro deal. And uh, now I knew if I ran out of budget, I could continue to run for the championship because I could take it out of next year's budget until I found more money. And boy, it snowballed. It was a drought. There was no water. There was nothing, and then it snowed, and then it snowballed, and the world went crazy. And 16 championships later, God bless you, Castro, for what you did for me. Every sponsor he's ever had has gotten far more than they bargained for, far more than they contracted for. And uh, that's been his business plan. Give the customer more than, more than they expect you to give them. And that is, I think, is, is the, the crux of his, his relationships with Castro. I mean, there are very few sponsorships in motorsports that have extended longer than John's relationship with Castro. 
The only one in drag racing is Kenny Bernstein and Budweiser, which went on for 30 years. And I think John has his eye on breaking that record at some point in time with Castrol. Even in those early days, back before I joined Castrol 25 years ago, they knew I had a fan following and I knew how to preach the gospel. But let me tell you, they came in from day one with a plan. From the day we painted the trucks and trailers, to the day we designed the cars, to the day that we put the decals on them, to when we went out to our first photo shoot, to everything that we did from commercials, they moved, moved with a game plan. It was just amazing how they orchestrated it. With the sponsorship from Castro, things really changed. We were able, we were able to pay our bills on time. <laughs> we were able to, um, we were actually able to grow our company. I started in 88. Castro came on in 85, 86, from what I remember, I was still in high school. But I, um, I just remember hearing my dad talk about, oh my gosh, we can fly now. Uh, a couple years into the deal, like, you know, things were starting to work pretty good and uh, we won our first race back in 1987.